Hello and welcome to an URSA campus breakdown course on introductory statistics and probability. This is a set of 20 lessons meant to provide you with a clear and meaningful explanation of all of the principal topics in any introductory statistics and or probability course. The course is divided into five modules. And this is the very first lesson in the course. Module one, introduction to statistics, part one, populations and samples. So let's get started. So we begin our lesson by talking about populations, which is really what statistical work is, is focused on. Populations are collections of things about which we're trying to get a better understanding. Now, populations can be uh, groups of people. For example, we may have a geographically defined um, area and call it a community. And each of the people that live in that community would together form the population. Or a population can be um, something other than people. For example, we may have a defined forest area and every individual tree in that forest area would make up the population. Or we could be looking at a species of animal in a particular ecosystem. And that population would, we, would be made up of all the individual um, members of the, that species in the ecosystem. Populations don't have to be about living things. For example, we might be looking at a, a, some defined commercial trading area. And we might be interested in a particular category of business venture. So every single business of that type in that area would be uh, an individual member of that population. Or we might be doing a climate study somewhere and we may decide to define a particular period of consecutive days um, for the study. So in that case, each individual day in that time period would be an individual in that population. Now the ideal situation when we're looking at a population is to be able to conduct what's called a census. A census is simply a study where every single individual in the population is observed or measured. So for example, if we are interested in finding out what residents in a community feel about a local um, project, if we're able to survey every single resident in the community, that would be a census. If we're trying to uh, figure out what um, the, say, the average height or di diameter of trees in a forest is, and we're able to measure every single tree, that would also be a census. If you're doing a population count of a particular animal species in an ecosystem, and you are somehow able to count all of the individuals, that too would be a census. If you're looking at a particular type of business venture in uh, a defined trading area and say you're able to do an audit of something like say profitability for every single business in that category in that area, that would be a census. And if you're doing a climate study and you're able to take um, maximum and minimum temperature readings for every single day in a defined time period, that too would be considered a census. When you do a census, you're collecting information from the entire population. So as long as your observations or measurements are done correctly and without error, then the facts that the data that you obtain from the population um, <clears throat> gives you a sort of a certain picture of the population with what we might call total accuracy. But in reality, and, and really in the bigger picture of things, most of the time, we're not able to do a census, either because it's not feasible, it might be too time consuming or expensive, uh, or it may actually be impossible to conduct a census. So for example, uh, we might be interested uh, in a population that is spread out over, uh, say of people uh, in a large city or a province or state or a country we may be looking at hundreds of thousands or millions of people and it would be very difficult to um, observe or measure 
each individual. One of the reasons for that as well is that in any population, particularly of people, you've got an element of transiency and fluctuation. And people are moving in, moving out. People are um, being born. People are dying. And so it becomes virtually impossible to pin down at any one point in time um, everyone in the population or the amount of time it would take to get through the entire population would see those changes in the population. And then there are very elusive populations. For example, if you're trying to do a population count for a wildlife species, an example might be cougars in a um, mountain region. These are animals that you're be very lucky if you can even see one of them. So the, the notion of being able to actually count every single individual in a population is something that becomes um, elusive to the point of impossible. So since most of the time it's not possible to do um, a census or not feasible, what most statistics is focused on is the next best option, which is to conduct what's called a sample. So a sample is essentially a subset of the population and, um, and, and usually much smaller than the overall population. And it's usually of a size that is feasible to conduct. And because a sample is not equal to the entire population, the, the, the data that we obtain doesn't give us information about the entire population with, with, with absolute certainty, but it, samples do allow us to derive estimates about those characteristics of populations that we might be interested in, in knowing. So for example, uh, if you say you have a community of 10,000 residents, and there's a referendum coming up with a particular question on the ballot, you might want to have an idea before the vote uh, of how people are feeling about that question. And while it might be unfeasible or impossible to survey all 10,000 residents, you might be able uh, realistically to conduct a sample of say 100 residents through a poll. Uh, similarly, in a forest, uh, you might be interested in uh, estimating the average age of trees. Um, you might want to know the average age of trees, but there may be upwards of hundreds of thousands or even millions of trees in that forest, which would make it unfeasible or impossible to do so. So you can take a smaller sample and you can use the information from that sample to derive an estimate for the average age. Uh, another type of sampling method is done uh, when we're trying to find the population of these elusive, more elusive species of animals. For example, if you're interested in a species of fish in a lake, it's very hard to see um, almost any of these fish in the lake, let alone all of them at any given time. So what people who are interested in, in fish populations will often do is uh, do a method called capture recapture where they'll go out and they'll, uh, they'll capture us uh, and, and count a certain number of fish in the lake. They'll identify those fish somehow. They'll release them back into the lake and then they'll allow some time to pass so that uh, presumably the fish have redistributed themselves kind of randomly and evenly in the lake. And then they'll go back out and take a second capture of fish and count them and then re-release them. And a little bit of uh, simple mathematics allows you to derive what can be quite accurate estimates for the population of fish in the lake. So if we're conducting a sample in place of a census, there's the uh, introduced problem of sampling error. And all samples are subject to error. And error is anything that makes the sample potentially um, non-representative of the overall population. And if it's insufficiently non-representative of the overall population, then that makes our, our study um, invalid. There's two kinds of sampling error that we need to talk about. And the distinction between them is that one is avoidable and one type isn't avoidable. So we'll start with the unavoidable type of error, which is called random error. Random error is basically the, uh, a result of simple chance due to the fact that when we select a sample, which is a subset 
only of the larger population. Uh, we, we can't fully control, um, as long as there's any variation within individ between individuals in the population, there's no way to fully control the possibility uh, that our sample may be uh, you know, overall too low or overall too high compared to the population. Even if we're doing everything right, even if we're selecting um, individuals randomly, even if our measuring, observing um, uh, tools are, are working correctly. For example, uh, we may go into a forest and pick a sample of trees uh, from that forest to measure the tree height. And uh, there's always a chance that um, the trees that we pick overall are smaller or maybe larger uh, than, than the overall population. Uh, the only way we can um, you know, mitigate the chance of that type of error is to take a larger sample because as your sample gets larger, the more extreme low and high end individuals will tend to cancel each other out and having more uh, more individuals in the sample increases the, the ability to have that sort of uh, random error cancelling out. Uh, but the only way to totally eliminate the risk of random error is to sample every individual in the population. In other words, to conduct a census. So it's only with a census that we can reduce the risk of random error to zero. The other type of error is systematic error. And this is avoidable error. Uh, and since it is avoidable, it's the type of error that we need to make an effort to, to minimize or reduce to zero. And basically systematic error is, is what results when anything in our sampling method uh, will increases the tendency for overall sampling error above and beyond random error. Now we should um, make a distinction between two types of systematic error. There's the unintentional systematic error, which results uh, if we, for example, have a faulty measuring device, or if the person using the measuring device doesn't know how to read it properly. Those types of errors can certainly be forgiven, although they do need to be, um, efforts need to be made to avoid those in order for the study to be valid. The other kind of systematic error um, merits a, a bit of discussion right here. That is the intentional systematic error. For example, a person studying tree, trees in a forest um, may go and pur purposely choose a sample that is uh, larger than an average or smaller than average. And to do this on purpose, that's actually an example of fraudulent uh, behavior. And that type of sampling has no rightful place in any study. So if you have a sample that only has random error, we call that a random sample. Uh, another name we can use for that is an unbiased sample. Now, a random sample, because it still does have the random error, could turn out to have values that are high or low compared to the overall population. However, what's really interesting to note here is that if we were to repeat this same sampling process over and over again. In other words, if we were to collect um, a number of such samples in succession from this population, what we would tend to find is that some of the samples would have values that were higher than the population and other samples would be lower. And there would be a tendency for the samples to uh, have their errors sort of cancel out the more samples that you took, uh, the more canceling out there would be. And you would end up with an overall picture that tended to represent quite closely the population. So that's actually a really good thing. And that's why random sampling is sort of the desirable type of sampling. On the other hand, there's what's called biased sampling. Any sample with systematic error, uh, we, we call a biased sample. So in the case of a bias sample, there's something in the way we're sampling that has a tendency, it introduces a tendency for values to be systematically too high or systematically too low. And what would tend to happen here if we took repeated samples is we will still see fluctuations because there's still the random error component. So from one sample to another, uh, we, may, we would still see uh, higher and lower values. But overall, 
the there wouldn't be this full canceling out tendency that we would see with random sampling. So there would still be this overall uh, picture given from the sampling that is either too high or too low. So what we are focused on in statistics is we, we aim for having um, random sampling and not biased sampling. Or another way to say this is unbiased sampling is what we're looking for uh, and not biased sampling. We're going to look at four different types of random sampling methods. But before we do, it's important to define what it is that makes a sample a random sample. And there's one thing that all types of random sampling have in common, which is that if a sample is a random sample, then every individual in the entire population has the same equal chance of being selected to be in the sample. As long as that criterion is met, you have a random sample. We're going to look at four particular kinds of random sampling, simple random sampling, stratified sampling, cluster sampling, and systematic sampling. Simple random sampling, as the name suggests, is the most basic form of random sampling. And in this method, you look at the entire population as a single group, and you randomly select your sample from the population. It's sort of like drawing names out of a hat, where the hat consists of all the individuals in the population, and you reach in and you pull out um, randomly. You know, you sort of shake the contents of the hat with all the all the names of the individuals, and you uh, randomly draw um, a certain number of uh, individuals based on how large you want your sample to be. And uh, there's your simple random sample. So, for example, let's say that you're doing a study that looks at the amount of time students university students spend doing homework. Uh, the way you might um, select a simple random sample from this population of students would be to uh, choose your sample size, which we would call a little n, uh, from the entire population, which we would call big N. And you would do something like put all the names in a hat uh, and draw your little n number from the big N number. And, you don't actually have to use a hat with slips of paper or that sort of thing. Of course, you could use other methods. Often what's done is uh, random generation uh, using a, some sort of a computer software. Uh, anything where the uh, probability of each individual being selected is the same. The next type of random sampling we look at is what's called stratified sampling. In a stratified random sample, we're particularly interested in how the overall population breaks down into subgroups. We call these strata. And we select our sample in such a way that whatever the pr proportion of individuals in the population is across the different strata, we reproduce that so that we have the same proportion uh, across the different strata in our sample. So for example, if we go back to the previous uh, example of a study looking at university students and how much time they spend on homework, uh, we might be interested in looking at uh, how uh, time spent on homework um, was distributed across different faculties of programs. So let's say, for example, that we had a university that had three faculties. Um, that were defined as follows. We had the humanities faculty with 55% of students and sciences and engineering have 30 and business faculty has 15% of all students. So what we would do with stratified sampling here is we would make sure that whatever the sample size was that we wanted to uh, select, we would make sure that the same per percentages uh, from the population uh, were selected in our sample so that 55% of our sample would be humanity students and 30% from sciences and engineering and 15% from business. So instead of 
you can think of this as instead of there being a names drawn out of a hat, it's actually now names being drawn out of three hats and such that the number of names chosen from each hat is proportional to what these three faculties um, are or have as numbers of students across the entire university population. Now, as you can as you can imagine, there's more work involved with stratified sampling compared with simple random sampling because you have to actually do the work of uh, finding out how many students are in the different faculties and then you have to organize your sampling so that you have the correct number of students drawn from each of these um, strata. Next we look at cluster sampling. Now we just looked at stratified sampling and talked about how it involves greater effort than simple random sampling. In the case of cluster sampling, this is a method we would generally use when we want actually to make less effort um, than would be required to do a simple random sample. And the reason for this is as follows. Uh, the way cluster sampling works is you, you take the population and then you divide it into equally populated subpopulations, which we can call clusters. And they're typically defined by, by some sort of physical or other type of location. The most common being like imagine a map and uh, you would have geographic boundaries which would define clusters of equal size. Then what happens is you determine your sample not by uh, proportionally taking the same amount from each cluster, but quite the opposite. What you do is you randomly select one or more of these clusters and the clusters that are chosen, you then sample all individuals within each of the selected clusters. So for example, if we return to the university student homework study, Imagine if there was a situation where it was too costly or time consuming to cover the entire campus. Perhaps it's a campus that is spread out over a wide um, area of a city or even a, a, a wider sort of region. If, if that sort of territorial coverage was, a, was a, a, a limiting constraint, one way that you could reduce the amount of territory that you needed to cover to do the sample would be to divide the the entire all of the regions in the university uh, into uh, these clusters with equal numbers of students. Then what you would do is you would, um, depending on how many students uh, you wanted in your sample, that would determine the number of clusters that you would want to select and you would randomly select that. So instead of putting individual names in a hat, so to speak, you would actually put the, the names of the clusters or the regions into a hat. You would randomly select uh, a subset of those clusters. And then you would go to each of those selected clusters and you would uh, sample every individual. Now, where are the savings in this method? Well, as you can imagine, if you're talking about particularly a very spread out geographic region, if you only have to go to a few of the clusters, that means you only need to go to a few places in the overall area. And if you're doing an entire cluster, you would, you would be basically going to people that were in close proximity to each other. So you would be literally covering less, less ground in order to fill your sample. Now, as you're probably or possibly thinking at this point, there, there may be some sort of inherent problem with cluster sampling, and there actually is one. Uh, one really important disadvantage of the cluster sampling method is that because some of the subpopulations, i.e. some of these clusters, don't get sampled at all because it's kind of all or nothing in terms of whether your cluster or area gets sampled, you could end up with very highly unrepresentative samples compared to the overall population, particularly if there are significant differences in the thing that you're observing or measuring from cluster to cluster. However, remember that the, the common criterion for all random samples is that 
every individual in the population has to have the same probability of being selected from the population to be part of the sample. And since, as long as all of the clusters have the same population, as long as we're then selecting clusters randomly, we do satisfy that criterion that in cluster sampling, every individual, regardless of what cluster they're located in, will have the same probability of being selected. Even though at the end, it comes down to a kind of all or nothing thing where, you know, either you and all of your cluster fellow cluster members will be selected or won't. But because it meets that criterion of having an equal probability still for all individuals in the population, cluster sampling is a random sampling method and can provide a lot of savings if covering the entire population um, is, is unfeasible. Mm. The last type of random sampling we look at is what's called systematic sampling. And what we do with this method is first we look at what our overall population size is, which is uh, big N, and what our desired sample size in, which size is, which is little n. And the, uh, the ratio big N divided by little n gives us a number k that's very important for this particular method. The way that systematic sampling works is that we basically go down the list of all individuals in the population and we select every kth individual beginning from some randomly selected starting point between the first and the kth value in the list. So for example, say we're looking at this university student homework study. And let's say that we have a population of 5,000 students from which we want to select a random sample of uh, 50 students. So that would give us a k value of 5,000 divided by 50, which equals 100. So we would proceed to select the sample as follows. The first thing we would do is we would uh, randomly select a number, we'll call it m, between 1 and 100. And let's say for the sake of this example that that number was chosen to be 63. So what this does is that the value m, the mth individual, which in this case is the 63rd individual on the list, is going to be the first individual selected for the sample. And then from there, the rest proceeds um, in, a, in a rhythmic form. We just go every uh, case subsequent position from our starting point and we select that individual to be in the sample. So if our first individual is the 63rd and our k value is 100, we would then skip to uh, 63 plus 100, which is 163. That 163rd individual would go into the sample. The next one would be the 263rd individual. And down the list, we would go uh, skipping in that uh, always by 100 and selecting every 100th individual in that way. So systematic sampling is a relatively easy uh, way to generate a random representative sample. Uh, the, in order to be able to do systematic sampling, uh, you have to be able to get uh, a list of all the individuals in the population. Uh, so it's uh, not enough to just have all the names uh, sort of jumbled up in a hat. You would actually need to have an ordered list. And one last important point uh, is that uh, for the systematic sampling method to be random, a random sampling method, uh, we cannot have a situation where uh, every case individual in the list is put in there uh, with a particular uh, characteristics. So for example, in this uh, university student example, we couldn't have a situation where, for example, all students uh, in every hundredth position had a similar grade if that was done intentionally. Not likely to be something that would happen, but if you could imagine a list where every hundredth uh, student in the list had a similar letter grade, uh, then we may expect our results uh, for the amount of time spent doing homework to not be random. Mm. 
The four different sampling methods we've looked at in this lesson are all examples of random sampling. We now close this lesson by looking at another method called convenience sampling. This is a method based upon trying to minimize the amount of effort required to generate a sample. So if we use the university student homework study again, examples of convenient sampling could be any of the following. Say we happen to be in the vicinity of the main university library on a Friday evening and simply survey the students who are there. Or we post an ad looking for study subjects wanted and simply take the first 100 students who reply. Or we could find ourselves in the vicinity of a group of students playing video games in their residence during class hours. Or we could simply set up an online poll on a student's social media website and take the responses that we get there. In each of these above cases, the sample might be very quick and easy to obtain. However, in each case, the sample that we actually get may and will likely consist of a very narrow cross-section of the overall student population, which would likely make it poorly representative of the population. As such, convenient sampling is not considered to be a form of random sampling, and therefore it should never be used where accurate or valid analysis is required. The following is a set of five practice questions that are meant to provide a set of review questions covering the material in this lesson. For each of the five questions, a study scenario is given and then we're asked to answer the following three questions. First, to describe the relevant population for the study. Second, what type of sample is being conducted and why? And third, is the sample biased or unbiased and why? In question one, a study is conducted to gain a better understanding of personal electronic device use among adults in a city. A map is drawn which divides the city into 20 districts with roughly equal population. Two of these districts are selected randomly and every adult in the selected districts are surveyed on their use of personal electronic devices. So the answers to this practice question are as follows. For question one, because it's specified that we're looking at personal electronic device use among adults in a particular city, the relevant population therefore would be the set of all adults in this city. For question number two, this is a cluster sample because the population here has been divided into equally sized clusters based on geographic location. And several of these clusters, in this case two clusters, have been randomly selected and then fully sampled. For question three, the sample is unbiased. And the reason it is is because of the fact that each individual has an equal chance of being selected. Now, as previously explained, when we, when we introduced the idea of cluster sampling, it's true that each individual sample via this method is not likely to be highly representative of the overall population, since most of the regions of the city will be left out of the sample. And there's 20 districts and we're only choosing two. So there's a very good chance that that will create a sample that is not <clears throat> necessarily very, very highly representative of the overall population. However, what's most important here is the fact that we still have each individual in the overall population having the same probability of being selected. And that's the reason why this sample would be unbiased. In question two, we have a study of student satisfaction at a university which is conducted by randomly generating a sample of 1,000 students from a list of the entire student body. 
For this one, the relevant population would be the set of all students in the university as per the description. This is what we call a simple random sample because we've simply selected from a single list of the entire population of students. And the sampling method here is unbiased because every student has an equal chance of being selected. In question three, to study the waste generation of households in a community, a number K between one and 20 is randomly selected. And starting from the Kth house on a map route, every 20th house has its curbside garbage audited. So the relevant population here would be the set of all households in this community. And this is a systematic sample because the population has been sampled by choosing a starting point randomly and then selecting every 20th household from that point. And finally, with this sampling method, every household does have an equal chance of being selected. And assuming, which would seem reasonable in this case, that choosing every 20th household will give a representative sample from the population, this would therefore be an unbiased sample. In question four, a referendum is to be held on whether or not to introduce a non-party system of parliament in Canada. To generate an estimate of public opinion on this issue, 100 delegates at the current governing party's convention in Ottawa are surveyed on their way out of the conference hall. So for this question, the relevant population would be the set of all voters in Canada. Now this is a convenient sample because the entire population of Canadian voters is being sampled here from one very narrowly defined event, an event that's limited only to delegates from one of the country's political parties, and for that matter, the governing party. Now with this sampling method, every voter in the country does not have an equal chance of being selected for this sample. Actually, this sample will only consist of delegates from the governing party. And this is presumably a group that would be heavily opposed to a non-party system. If you think about the motivations of the people who are members of that party and what it would mean to introduce a non-party system, which would pretty much render their party no longer existent. So therefore, this is a very clear example of a biased sample. Finally, we have question five. In order to produce a more balanced survey on the referendum from the previous question, information about Canadian voters' membership in political parties is first examined. Based on the percentage of voters who are members of each registered political party, as well as the, as well as the percentage who are not members of any party, a sample is generated with proportional randomly selected subsamples covering each of these affiliations. So once again, the relevant population here, as with question four, is the set of all voters in Canada. This time, however, we have a stratified sample. We're taking the entire population of Canadian voters and dividing them into relevant strata that covers the entire population. And then we randomly sample within each stratum to make a proportional, proportional overall sample. So with this sampling method, every voter in the country this time does have an equal chance of being selected. Provided, of course, that these strata are proportional to Canadian voters' membership or not in the various political parties as well as those who are not members. And as long as this assumption is valid, then we can consider this to be an unbiased sample. I hope that you found this video helpful. If you liked it and would like to see more from MRSA Campus, then please subscribe. And also, if you'd like to send your feedback, that's always welcome too. Thanks for watching, and I wish you well with your studies.